Hi, everybody. Uh, I'd just like to also thank <coughs> Lev, Noah, Jeremy, uh, and Helena for organizing, and all the other folks who went into organizing this event. My name is Mark C. Marino. I teach at the University of Southern California, and this presentation is about critical code studies. In December 2006, I gave a presentation at the Mar Language Association where I was asking the question, are critical readings of source code possible? A question that had already been picked up by many scholars up to that point, and there was some occasion for debate, at least on the panel in which I presented, which uh, consisted of John Cayley and Florian Kramer and I, and uh, being a sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, outcast or outsider or whatever I was, it, it was a provocation that was worth discussing, at least for a few days, and soon that question seemed to be answered. In fact, it seems like with the increase in the number of natural language, nat natural language or high-level languages that exist, like processing and then Form 7, the need to even have the question, will there be code that we can read and interpret the way we interpret natural language is becoming moot? And even the question, who reads the code, uh, this is the fellow I think most of us imagine who's reading the code, um, is also uh, a little bit moot. And in other words, people have already had the discussion. Everyone's convinced that it's not just written for computers. In fact, it's primarily written for humans because the computers don't need any high-level language or even these extensive semantic strings uh, for them to see what is going on in the program. Some of the people doing critical code studies have join, joined together under the auspices of a blog called Critical Code Studies. Dot com. The people who aren't uh, a part of that blog, sorry, this one's going to make me wait, uh, we call affiliates, because, and those are people who typically had some other blog already that they considered to be doing the work of critical code studies and didn't feel the need to uh, take the role on a, a subheading or a subclassification. So here, here are some of the folks we might put in that, that particular category. Um, they, are, they are folks upon whose work I drew for the original paper, and they're people who continue to promote the analysis of code. One of the things I'd like to present now, though, is the next stage in the program, as far as I'm interested for the analysis of code, is that while a lot of people believe that we can and should interpret code, still when I look at uh, manuscripts, when I look at articles, when I look at papers, yeah, I see very few actual lines of code being analyzed anywhere. And once again, I, I feel like I should say present company excluded, but, but not entirely, because um, uh, some have said explicitly they're not going to talk about the code, uh, but, but even more importantly, uh, when you, look, when you look, do a, a reading of, of some of these texts, you are aware of the enormous amount of setup perhaps needed before you can get to that line of code, the amount of literacy, the amount of training you have to do with your audience before you can get to a particular line of code, or perhaps, as is in the case of literature, finding that line of code worth talking about uh, can be very difficult. And maybe to go uh, a step, step further, finding one line and demonstrating its value in terms of the anal analysis of the program can also be uh, quite crucial. But my, my guess is that we don't have enough methodologies yet for how we are going to use the literal code as part of our interpretive process. The, first step that many critics take, and I, so far I've seen about eight critics do this, is to take a version of the program Hello World. Uh, Nick and Michael do it in their paper. Um, I've seen, there were a number of presentations at SLSA. I think I saw three in a row at the last SLSA in which everyone interpreted some version of Hello World. So if you want to begin critical code studies, apparently starting with interpreting the program Hello World, which is one of those initial programming uh, objects that students work on when they are initiated into a language is a good place to start. It's fairly easy to talk about in its relationship to language and to our human communication is fairly clear. And then we turn to the question of how do we read code. Once again, some code we can read fairly easily because of its natural language affinities. My goal too also is to throw a, a little bit of uh, a fly in the ointment is to continue to push us to be critical, literally using uh, critical theory. I know that Espen Arseth has made the move uh, to try to push out the colonization of new media by theory, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually okay with that. I think we, should, uh, we can colonize whatever we'd like. I think theory is meant to be applied to objects, and I, I see nothing wrong, unless you're saying 
that the object is the fulfillment of the theory, and, and, and then, of course, that's, that's kind of a backwards argument to make. But if you're saying, I can use this theory to understand this object better, it seems, seems perfectly clear to me. Um, at the valve, they've asked, they've said, well, there's this pattern where people do this thing, and they say critical X study, you know, critical something studies. There's critical information studies I've seen on a particular blog, um, critical legal studies, cl critical race studies. What's important to me for drawing upon critical legal studies is that we've got a functional document that gets interpreted by critical theory. Similarly, we can use, uh, we, we can see the analogy with computer code. More importantly, I want to mention that, uh, so any of the branches that we could see from pro-structuralism, feminism, race theory, constructivism certainly, um, uh, deconstruction, anything that you can do on literature, I, I believe you can do on code, and more. Sorry, this is my error message to myself for putting Racer X into a presentation. So here are some of the ways that people tend to read code that I've seen so far. They read code against other sign systems. Okay, to say, how is it different than others? Rita Rayleigh has done this. A number of other people in this room have done this. To say, well, it's, it's actually different than speech because it is performative in some way or because it's materialized in a way that speech is not. They read it against the, the, the for, form of the code. The code itself is the form against the content of the program itself or about what it's trying to produce. They take two different pieces, implementations of the same process in different languages and compare those. I've seen that done a number of times. We can also read the code itself against socio-historical context or the deep structures that may have uh, either funded that particular code or have moved that along or have, um, have influenced it in another way. We can see, we can read the code against the output as in this case using ELISA. We can read some of the, nat one of my favorite things is just to find a high level language and look at the natural language affinities as in this Lisp example. We can read code against pre-digital codes like this, uh, this is a, a Hammurabi's code. And we can read ma many other aspects of the code. The rhetoric of it, the economics of it, the politics of it. I, I encourage the, the reading, I'm almost done, encourage the reading of the paratexts for, this is why we see so little code in the papers, because the paratexts are the, the most important part of setting up that, that particular reading. And my, my, I guess my most daunting moment in this whole presentation is that when I try these particular critical code studies moves, inevitably I'm faced with the fact that maybe all I'm doing is an elaborate metaphor. I understand one thing about the code, the way it's operating, this one line, and I'm, operating, I'm using it to make something explicit that I understand about the, the sort of cultural value of this particular piece of software. And on some level, I feel like, well, why don't I just use cooking, right? Why don't I just use a metaphor from butterflies at that point? And so I do think we need to make very serious and elaborate arguments about why this particular functionality of the code is relevant to the way it plays out in our culture. Okay. And, and that is it for me. Thank you very much, everybody.